Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica Haller-Stevenson, and I am the Senior Program Analyst for Chronic Disease Prevention at the National Association of County and City Health Officials. I focus on chronic disease and tobacco. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana Kosmatsik, and I am the Senior Analyst at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and I also focus on tobacco and chronic disease prevention. We would like to welcome you to today's interactive webinar, Creating and Enforcing Smoke-Free Multi-Unit Housing. Smoke-Free Multi-Unit Housing benefits residents and property owners alike. With smoke-free policies in place, more residents become non-smokers, and they breathe air free of second and third hand smoke. Property owners benefit from lower costs to turning over units, increased demand from prospective residents, and lower insurance premiums due to decreased risk of fire. Health departments have a role in working with housing agencies and private owners to promote policies. Today's webinar will focus on the implementation and enforcement of tobacco-free policies in multi-unit housing, the legal implications, and how you can be involved in the effort. We will introduce each of our speakers before they present on the call today. All phone lines for participants have been muted during this webinar. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please post it to the chat box on your screen at any time during the webinar. These questions will be used during the Q&A after today's presentations. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to provide us with feedback on today's webinar. We really do look forward to hearing your comments. Also, a recording of this webinar will be posted to the NACHO and ASTHO website in the next few days. The, these site addresses will be available on the last slide of today's presentation. Thank you, Diana. As a reminder to everyone, please take a look at your screen and make note of the technical support phone number that you see, 1-800-843-9166, which can help you with troubles with audio and video component. You will also find in the chat box a phone number for those of you who do not have computer speakers. The preferred method for audio transmission is your computer speakers. If you do not have any or they are not working, in the chat box you will find a phone number to give you an audio alternative. And as a reminder, you will submit all of your questions through the chat box. You can type them as we go along through the presentation. And thank you, Diana, for giving us some background information about the webinar and smoke-free smoke multi-unit housing. We are joined by an esteemed panel of experts today who will be telling you individually more about their specific role in tobacco control and or multi-unit housing. Before each speaker, we will provide a brief introduction. We anticipate that there will be many questions for our speakers, so we have made an effort to allot time for that at the conclusion of the panel presentation. For our audience, we will use the terms multifamily housing and multi-unit housing synonymously. Our speakers will also be discussing public housing, government subsidized housing, and private housing. Our first speaker today is Peter Ashley. Peter directs the Policy and Standards Division within HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. The division manages the award of grants and contracts for research on residential hazard assessment and control methods, and it contributes to policy development for the office's programs. He received a Doctor of Public Health from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and a Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan. His previous professional experience includes serving as Director of the Division of Environmental Health Assessment for the Maryland Department of the Environment and as a toxicologist at a private consulting firm. We are thrilled to have Peter with us today. Peter, I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Diane. I appreciate that uh, introduction. And thanks to the audience for uh, calling in today um, to hear about this important topic. I'm just going to go through uh, briefly. I've probably got too many slides, so I'll go quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the history of HUD Smoke-Free Housing Initiative. Uh, and then um, at the end, I'm going to talk about some um, some activities that uh, we're planning to uh, implement this year. <clears throat> so the um, HUD's initiative started in uh, 2009 with the publication of an official program notice by our Office of Public and Indian Housing 
the notice um, encouraged um, public housing agencies uh, to adopt uh, smoke-free policies in at least some of their multifamily properties. And it went through um, different aspects of uh, the policy, uh, reasons for doing it, the fact that it's legal, et cetera. Um, that was followed in, in 2010 by a similar notice that was uh, put out by our, our Office of Housing that um, focused on um, subsidized uh, multifamily housing. Um, sometimes you'll hear that uh, referred to as project-based Section 8. So it's privately owned uh, subsidized housing. In 2012, um, we, the, the Office of Public Housing uh, updated their notice and we released what we called our smoke-free housing toolkits. Uh, these were separate uh, toolkits for uh, residents and for owners, owners and managers. Uh, again, uh, promoting uh, smoke-free housing and answering um, frequently asked questions, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, toolkit after, after this slide. Uh, also in that year, we published a federal register notice soliciting public comment on HUD's uh, smoke-free initiative. Uh, we especially looked for um, <clears throat> barriers uh, to implementation and tried to, try to identify uh, best practices um, by those who have implemented uh, smoke-free policies. And then recently, in October of this year, uh, we published what we refer to as our action guide, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about that. So this slide just shows the um, cover of the smoke-free toolkit for uh, owners, managers. Um, we released that in June. Uh, it was endorsed by uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Lung Association, and CDC's Office of Smoking and Health. Uh, they all signed a, a letter uh, at the front of the toolkit. Um, we uh, actually sent a hard copy to uh, 22, about 2,200 housing authorities, executive directors uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, and as I mentioned, we uh, we had a separate uh, toolkit that was geared towards uh, residents. These are still posted um, on our website. So uh, the toolkit for, for managers, uh, not surprisingly, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the guidance in this area tends to follow a similar pattern, uh, reasons to adopt the smoke-free policies, legal issues. Uh, for quite a while, they, there was confusion among uh, housing providers as to the legality of uh, smoke-free policies. Uh, I hope that's uh, not the case any longer. Uh, it's, it's clear that it's legal um, to, to uh, adopt these, these policies. So uh, it made, the toolkit made that very clear. Uh, recommendations on adopting policies, uh, FAQs, uh, we included the HUD notices. And uh, I just wanted to mention that the, the toolkit uh, it didn't have a lot of original material. It reproduced uh, several uh, existing brochures. Um, that moves, uh, I'd like to move on to the uh, more recent document, the uh, action guide that I mentioned. Um, this really came out of our Federal Register notice, uh, the comments that we received. Uh, once we got these, we thought, geez, we should really package these and make them uh, useful. Uh, to housing providers um, because we did get uh, quite a few suggestions for best practices and discussions of barriers. So we did package uh, that information and we got, uh, of course, additional information as well. Uh, one aspect of this guidance was uh, uh, interviews with uh, nine early implementers of smoke-free housing, what we referred to as smoke-free pioneers in the guide. <clears throat> so the the guide, um, not surprisingly, covers reasons to adopt smoke-free uh, housing policies. Uh, the interviews with our nine uh, pioneers, that covered uh, public housing agencies, subsidized multifamily, and market rate housing. And uh, a couple of the, uh, the presenters today uh, participated in this um, document. Scott Alderman was uh, one of the uh, pioneers who was interviewed, and then um, Carmen Moore Minor um, from Nashville was um, also interviewed. I know John's presenting today, but his uh, organization was represented. Um, again, we have uh, FAQs. Uh, we go through recommended steps for adopting uh, smoke-free policy, and then uh, appendices with uh, HUD notices and additional um, 
information, including a summary of the Federal Register comments. This is a um, quote from one of the uh, smoke-free pioneers. Um, I was adamant that the policy was going to take too much effort and we were going to be spending our whole lives to get people to stop smoking. It was not actually like that at all. Um, this is a, a common uh, misconception. Uh, there, there are several, uh, but uh, this one often revolves around enforcement that will be impossible to enforce. It, it does take effort, uh, but uh, it is very doable. Um, um, like any uh, lease requirement, um, you know, it can be done. It's got to be done in a careful uh, manner, um, and our speakers today will talk about that. But uh, often uh, those who have not uh, adopted policies uh, believe that it's going to be harder than it ends up being. This um, slide just shows uh, a navigation page in the guide. Uh, so in the guide and the electronic version, there are hyperlinks that will take you um, to the, the different sections that has the information that you can see on the screen. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, implementation steps in that uh, second row uh, down. So uh, why a smoke-free policy? Um, you heard, I think most of you understand that, especially from a health perspective. Um, from a housing perspective, it's cheaper for the uh, housing provider. At unit turnover, uh, you don't have to do as much cleaning when you're turning over a, a, a unit of a smoker. Uh, there's usually fire damage, uh, additional uh, coatings of paint, and more cleaning. That adds up uh, the range, depending on the size of the unit. You hear uh, 100 to maybe $700 a unit. Um, Secondhand smoke cannot be uh, controlled. It migrates between units. You cannot stop that. Uh, residents prefer smoke-free housing policies. Uh, another misconception, I think, is that, um, oh, the residents won't, um, won't buy in. You know, there will be just too much opposition. The uh, smokers might be vocal, but um, surveys consistently show that uh, the majority of residents prefer a uh, smoke-free environment. And I mentioned that they are legal. If we unpack the uh, health and safety aspects a bit, I think most of you uh, understand and know about this information, um, the number of toxic chemicals in secondhand smoke, many carcinogens, a leading cause of fatal fires, another source of, uh, of, a, of problems for housing providers, of course. Uh, they can get sometimes a break on their insurance policies, too, uh, if they adopt smoke-free um, housing policies. Um, this one, uh, let's see, the fourth bullet, uh, it's, it's just something that's not that well known. Uh, secondhand smoke is a significant source of lead exposure for young children, especially now that we're more concerned about lower and lower uh, blood lead levels. Um, so there's pretty compelling reasons to do it. Uh, these are the recommended uh, action steps. I'm not going to spend much time on these. First one, um, housing provider needs to do their homework talk to other providers who have adopted smoke-free policies, look for community partners. Of course, that's where health departments uh, fit into the picture. Move forward, develop the, the policy and plan, uh, survey residents. If there's a board of directors, like there is for a lot of um, public housing agencies, uh, present the idea to the board, tell them why it's a good idea, um, and obtain their approval. Uh, prepare to implement. Um, one thing you could do um, that housing providers could do is uh, anticipate residents, residents that might have problems. Um, maybe they're smokers who are uh, mobility impaired. Um, you could move them closer to doors uh, if you allow smoking on the um, property. Uh, if they're cognitively impaired, uh, memory problems. I've heard where uh, one uh, housing provider actually they went in and put signs up in the woman's um, apartment reminding her that she wasn't supposed to smoke inside. Enforcement, uh, consistent enforcement uh, and timely enforcement um, and providing uh, cessation, uh, access to cessation services uh, is really important and again that's where health departments come in. Progress to date, um, we've had, uh, this is, of course is uh, an optional voluntary um, policy, uh, our 
current unofficial count is about 15% of the uh, housing, public housing agencies that have conventional public housing um, have adopted smoke, at least some smoke-free policies in, in at least some buildings, covering about 186,000 housing units. And we really appreciate the help from those of you who have, who have worked with them. Um, let's see, we know that we're getting uh, quite a few on the multifamily property side, we just don't have a good estimate there. And then uh, this year, I just wanted to mention, uh, we have some contractor help. We're gonna hold a couple of webin webinars on the topic. Uh, one probably going through our guide, and then one I think will focus on enforcement. Uh, we're, go we're going to improve our website, provide a, a better um, information uh, on that site for housing providers. So if any of you have any suggestions, uh, please get back to me. We, we want to provide a lot of practical information, reduce barriers to implementation. And then uh, we're gonna develop uh, some standard uh, briefings, PowerPoint briefings, uh, executive briefings, and one uh, for members of our uh, office. So that's it. Um, thanks very much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, Peter, for your comments today. We really appreciate you sharing the recommendations and the critical role that state and local health departments can play in implementing smoke-free multi-unit housing. As a reminder to our participants, a recording of today's webinar and the slides will be posted to the ASCO and NHO website for the next few days. In addition, within the next few days, each of our participants will also be mailed, emailed a copy of all the slides that will be um, shown throughout the webinar today. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Scott Alderman. Scott joined Landora Management Associates in 1999 as a property manager trainee. Now, as president, he is responsible for operations including hiring and supervising of regional property managers, policy and procedure development, the financial performance of the properties, quality control of physical assets, supervisory visits, and quality control over regulatory correspondence. Scott has an MBA in business administration with an emphasis in healthcare management from Gardner Webb University. We are thrilled to have Scott with us today. Scott, I will turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, like Peter, I appreciate everyone taking time to be here today. And after seeing his presentation, it's nice to know that some of our information is going to be repetitive. So it's good to know that uh, a lot of us are on the same page. Um, <clears throat> and I know Peter talked about the, how we all got started in our smoke-free housing push was in 2009 the letter from HUD that came out allowing owners and operators and managers to take their housing units smoke-free. And then in January of 2010, over a 10-day period, our organization experienced a little over 1.2 million of loss that were directly to smoking-related losses. Uh, so we started our process in 2010 where we talked about different um, how we were going to implement smoke-free housing and then how we went through it which I will get into later and answer questions for so but you know why go smoke-free housing you know there's the health and safety of it the, the reduces risks to the property in our fires thankfully uh, there was no one no one has been hurt but to that end after we have implemented our smoke-free housing policy we had someone that smoked in their unit fell asleep burnt the bed burnt the unit they were um, they lost their life in it, and oddly enough, when uh, we went into the unit, they had signs on their front door that smoking wasn't allowed within their respective unit. So, people are getting the uh, the idea. It's just the follow through of it is sometimes um, difficult to stick with. But you have insurance implications. Like I said, we had 1.2 million losses in a matter of 10 days, and speaking with your insurance agents, those are not comfortable conversations to have. Uh, you can also reduce your long-term operating and maintenance and capital needs. And as was discussed earlier, the appeal and marketability of a smoke-free housing unit is becoming more popular. You know, it's, and it's a healthy choice. You know, secondhand smoke has proven to be harmful. And as Peter said earlier, it can go through units and buildings undetected. And uh, if people live next to smokers that have uh, asthma or things of that nature, you know, it can cause a serious issue and put your, your neighbors and staff at risk. 
And fortunately, some of our residents have actually chosen to quit smoking with, uh, due to the policy because what they were needing was some type of a, a sign, if you will. And when this rolled out, a lot of people chose to stop. <clears throat> you can see the picture on the slide. That is from one of the fires uh, that we lost. That is one of our properties in North Carolina that, that burnt completely. Uh, and you know, smoking-related fires, you know, 9,000 a year, 67 of them are, are percent or by discarded smoking materials. <clears throat> and we chose, when we implemented our smoke-free policy, to not allow people to smoke anywhere within the unit, and we have a 25-foot basis for it, just because that the bedroom was the top origin, and then right outside on porches and balconies was the second. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So who's really at risk? Well, fire is a risk to your residents, staff, first responders, fire and rescue teams, Smoking related fires can put innocent people out of their homes. You know, the best way to handle loss is to prevent it. So, you know, you don't want to have to make a phone call to someone's family member letting them know that something bad has happened, that their life has been lost in a fire, which very easily could have happened in this. If you'll see this slide, those are, that's the fire coming through the building of a 40 unit rural development 515 tax credit property that housed elderly and disabled. Ten units were totally destroyed. They burnt firewall to firewall. And because the building structure was all one structure, no one was allowed to remain in the building due to safety reasons. So we had to, to find housing for all 40 people. And <clears throat> it took, you know, three weeks to find everything, and the firewalls prevented the entire building to burn down. But you can see this one lost by itself, you know, was $769,000 worth of repair. That's another picture of one of our properties. You know, this this resident was smoking uh, while on an oxygen tank. Uh, an ember fell from her cigarette. It burned a hole in the oxygen, and it acted as a blowtorch, and it burnt the entire building. Um, so we had to take it all the way down to the slab and rebuild it completely. And you see the actual cost there is a little over 500000 You want to know, how, why does it cost so much? Well, you have, you have the, demolition, the demolition and the reconstruction that you have to think of. The new requirement for potential code upgrades, permits, architectural costs, fire department fees. At the elderly apartment, we had to pay police officers and fire, department, office, <clears throat> and fire departments to sit in the parking lot to ensure no one went into the building and to ensure that no one went into the building to take other people's belongings. Then you have <clears throat> you know, your rental loss, potential legal fees. And it doesn't include the time spent by your staff. It's very difficult to quantify that amount of time. You know, you say, well, you know, I have plenty of insurance. Well, it's likely that it's going to hit your savings account or whatever money you have put away to make other repairs. Then you have to worry if your insurance is going to be dropped. And how, how do you convince your insurance carrier that you're doing all you can to prevent fires? Well, if you retain the, the coverage, you, know, you could easily have a premium increase of 15% or more. Or like us, we had to accept a higher deductible to keep our insurance affordable to our properties. And, and like I stated before, some insurers are offering some discounts for smoke-free housing. Then it's going to reduce your ongoing costs, your routine maintenance costs, you know, for repainting, filters and repairs, floor covers, market-ready turnovers, and then you have your capital items, you know, your heating and air units, floors, blinds, lights, appliances. <clears throat> um, and then there's the, the marketability of the property. People are enjoying smoke-free housing now. It, it, people like the fact that they can go into a unit that they know that has not been smoked in. And there's, there's polls and surveys that are showing support and smoking outside. It's a national trend. And, and we use things to our marketing advantage to, to get people in, to let them know that our property is actually smoke-free. And is it allowable? Yes. Yes, it is allowable. You know, smokers are not a protected class. Like, like I said earlier, HUD has encouraged us to, to um, take our property smoke-free. Other housing programs have been receptive. When I say other housing programs, I'm talking about uh, the USDA rural development, uh, the tax credit uh, providers, syndicators. A lot of folks are, are really behind this um, smoke-free housing initiative. You know, we have to, re you know, you have to reduce or revise your, um, your lease addendum, your house and rules. And some offices suggest possibility of reasonable accommodation for hardships. We to date have not had any reasonable accommodations. We've had requests, but we haven't had any that we've had to approve 
because for someone to enjoy the community doesn't mean that they have to smoke to enjoy the community. So that there is no nexus between the accommodation and the smoking. And so if, if, when you get into this, you are going to need to speak with your legal counsel to get their information and see what they have to say. So how does it work? For us, for our properties, we tell people you're not required to quit smoking. But you cannot smoke on our properties or in, inside our units or in common areas, which you know, include lobbies, halls, and bathrooms, playgrounds, um, apartment units, balconies, porches, and you have to stay 25 feet away. Or you can have specifically designated areas. Uh, and it applies to everyone that comes onto the property. That's the residents, their, their guests, your staff, your contractors. So the process we went through is we worked with our legal counsel to get information to make sure that we were not going to overstate anything or get into a fair housing situation. Then we submitted it to Rural Development and HUD for their approval, and then we prog uh, provide notices to the residents and had residents sign lease addendums and rules stating that they understood. We let our staff know and let all our, our contractors know. And then we provided uh, cessation inf information to all our residents. And then we installed you know, waste receptacles, and then we advertised that it's a smoke-free um, property. And implementation of the process and the enforcement, it, it's very important. Um, you know, cause having, having rules that aren't enforced or is worse than having no rules uh, at all. Here's some sample notices that I have that uh, I'd be more than happy to make available to those that would uh, like to have them after the fact. Uh, it just gives some information uh, about what you can give to people. You know, and then we, our, our Q&A that we sent out to residents, we let them know uh, who they could call, who they could contact in whatever state they were, we were doing business in. Um, you know, we have tenant warnings just, just for smoking. So what is the cost? Well, the cost, you know, you have your staff time, your legal preparation, your notification of your residents, you know, some purchasing, some different things. Uh, you know, if you des designate a specific facility, you know, you may have some costs associated with that. Um, no, we, uh, we chose not to have designated smoking areas just for the simple fact that if we had a smoking area, that we would be forced to make that area handicap accessible. And... You know, since we didn't really, we don't want the smoking to take place, we decided not to give you know an alternate uh, area to go to. So enforcement, how do we enforce it? Now we don't do like the the guy there with the camera. You know, we don't take Gestapo tactics and try to hunt people down. But we identify it during routine inspections. You know, we look for cigarette butts and evidence, and and then we give warnings for uh, lease violations for no smoking. You know, health and safety risks and enjoyment, the livability of the apartments. Uh, um, for their neighbors, you know, and we use photographs as evidence, and we charge for related damages, and we issue terminations uh, and warnings. So a lot of questions that we get, or, or if you have questions about what you want to do, you know, you can consider testing a few sites before you jump in. Um, just keep in mind that you have fair housing concerns and how you choose your properties. We did not grandfather anybody because when it said that we didn't have to, we decided that we weren't going to because we didn't want to have some people smoking in some units and then other, other units not. So we did a rollout, so all of our units were smoke-free. We had very, very little pushback. Um, when we put out information, we had a less than 2% complaint rate uh, to let them know <coughs> about the smoking. And what we did is we tried to make sure that we let the resident know what benefit it is to them, that it's healthy for them. It's a cost savings to them, not that it's going to save the apartment community money on their insurance premium. That's what we found inside one of one of the residence units that was that was burnt. You can see that's in about eight oxygen tanks. Thankfully, none of them exploded, but it did burn enough to char all of them. Um, so we had a big, huge safety. That we avoided a, a huge. It's hard to tell what could have happened if something would have happened. You know, it was just uh, we're very very fortunate that nothing went went further wrong. But you know, if you're still trying to figure out whether you want to do this or, or not, uh, you can certainly contact me. I will give you all the pluses and minuses that I can give you and, and let you learn from what we experienced and went through. Um, so hopefully that you can have a successful implementation period. So I look forward to answering questions at the end. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate you sharing the great work that you're doing and the successes of Landura Management Associates' smoke-free multi-unit housing policy. 
Just a reminder, because we're getting some questions, that the slides will be available uh, at following the presentation and webinar. Uh, I know that we're going through some of the information pretty fast, but you'll be able to access it through the archived slides. Next, I want to welcome our following speakers, Esmerna Damas and Kathleen McCabe. As Renata DeMasso has been with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program since 2007. She has worked in the area of tobacco cessation and currently coordinates the program's tobacco prevention and smoke-free housing efforts. Kathleen McCabe joined the HRIA team in 2007 and brings both strategic leadership and technical content expertise to that company's policy and practice work. During her tenure there, she has managed the organization's smoke-free housing work, led best practice policy research in the areas of transportation, chronic disease prevention, climate change, and healthy homes, and partnered with HRA's colleagues on both strategic planning and health impact assessment. We're pleased to have both of them with us today, and I will turn it over to them. All right, thank you so much. Um, so Kathleen and I will be presenting on smoke-free housing specifically in Massachusetts. Through this presentation, listeners will, uh, will be able to explain the need for addressing secondhand smoke in multi-unit dwellings. They'll be able to identify key partners for the process. They'll be able to describe the approach here in Massachusetts. They'll be able to understand how smoke-free policies are implemented, and they'll be able to describe the multi-pronged approach to effective enforcement. All right, so why did we in Massachusetts decide to address smoke-free housing in multi-unit dwellings? Um, in 2004, uh, Massachusetts implemented the smoke-free workplace law. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health then established a complaint line where violations of the law could be reported. We were getting, we noticed that we were getting a number of calls about exposure to secondhand smoke, specifically in the homes and multi-unit dwellings. And based on volume, uh, we noticed that it was maybe worthwhile um, addressing secondhand smoke exposure in the home. We were also getting interest from landlords. We also had enough information from the BFSS letting us or indicating to us that many residents were still being exposed to secondhand smoke, even though there was a smoke-free workplace law into effect. Um, and we noticed that it was specifically in, in the home that they were being exposed. And through the Surgeon General and other sources, we knew about the effects of secondhand smoke exposure, and we knew that indoor policies are effective in reducing exposure to secondhand smoke. So all of these factors pushed us here in Massachusetts to promote smoke-free housing policies in multi-unit dwellings specifically. We, in order for us to develop an approach, we were able to engage a number of traditional partners that included local tobacco programs, um, including local boards of health. We were able to engage landlords, both from the public and private sector, and also condo associations. We also engaged a number of public health attorneys in the process. And um, as a result of the, of the work and engaging these partners, Partners, we were able to develop an approach, and in 2008, the Massachusetts Department of Public, Public Health began to promote the voluntary adoption of smoke-free housing policies. We, we did this and continue to do this through our statewide technical assistance partners. We educate housing providers, for example, private landlords, condo associations, and affordable housing agencies as well. We provide tools, training, process recommendations and policy guidance. And we do this all with an emphasis on educating residents and also engaging them in the process. So how do we uh, accommodate for the needs of residents as we move forward with smoke-free housing policies? It's an ongoing process. Um, we, our initial efforts focus on landlord um, education with an emphasis on resident engagement at the core of the process. Uh, we did notice that there was an increased concern about resident displacement, which has led us or led us to partner with a number of resident advocacy groups and service organizations. 
And we learned quite a bit from our process or through our work with the Boston Housing Authority. We learned again, or um, it was emphasized to us, the importance of engaging residents in the process, especially listening to the residents, um, getting to know what their concerns were, and coming up with ideas or ways in which to address those concerns. Maybe some of the residents had um, needed connection to cessation resources, so we were able to address some of those concerns by connecting them with resources at the state level and also locally. And more recently, there has been a focus in ensuring compliance which has led us to engage new partners in the process, specifically legal aid lawyers, judges, and clerk magistrates, and also tenant um, preservancy, excuse me, tenant preservancy programs as well. So now I will pass it on to Kathleen so she can discuss a little bit about the implementation and also um, a little bit about the enforcement or compliance piece of the process. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. This is Kathleen McCabe. I work at a public health, advocate, or public health uh, institute in Boston called Health Resources in Action. And we've been fortunate enough to partner with the Mass Department of Public Health since 2008 in providing technical assistance statewide um, here in Massachusetts to um, housing agencies and health organizations as they're, con as they're moving forward with the smoke-free housing process. Um, as Myrna mentioned, our approach here has been to encourage the voluntary adoption of smoke-free housing policies by landlords and condos, in including their management companies. And so um, I sort of split up how we encourage implementation of the rules um, in a couple different categories. One is that um, we've created a series of tools similar to the ones that Peter Ashley was describing um, in the HUD um, toolkit that landlords can access um, through our website, also through trainings that we provide to really make the process easier on their parts. So they're not creating anything new. Um, we encourage resident engagement and um, education throughout the process, and so to do that we've created um, survey tools, um, key message flyers, things that will um, really help the landlord through the process of transitioning to smoke-free housing um, with, like as Marna said, a really a core focus on engaging residents um, and demonstrating demand from residents for smoke-free housing. That's really sort of a core part of our process. We also encourage that that resident education would continue through the implementation and enforcement of the policy and is not just sort of a one-off thing. Um, in addition to the technical assistance that we provide, we're also promoting um, sort of a broader level systems change around smoke-free housing. Um, and one of the um, wins that we've had in the last year is um, that our Department of Housing and Community Development, which is our state agency um, similar to HUD, but it's a state-funded agency that provides um, funding and other types of um, you know, training and technical assistance for our local public housing. Um, they have also issued guidance encouraging all of our public housing in Massachusetts to go smoke-free, and that was um, a really big, uh, exciting success for us here. Um, we've explored other incentives for encouraging um, new development to go smoke-free at, uh, at sort of the municipal level. Uh, as Vernon mentioned, that we're beginning to educate the judiciary in Massachusetts to um, help understand why um, implementing smoke-free housing rules are really important um, should a case come before our housing court. They sort of understand the context in which the case is being brought. Um, and we're also integrating smoke-free housing into sort of a broader healthy homes approach. Um, in terms of enforcement and compliance with the rules, since we've been working on this um, for about five years now, we're able to look back and sort of begin to reflect on what of the approach has worked and what hasn't, where landlords are running into issues around enforcement and compliance. And um, some of the things that we've learned are that 
places that really do have a sort of a resident-driven process where there's a demonstrated demand um, through the surveys for, for a policy um, and engaging residents to sort of be champions has been a really effective tool for us. Um, we also encourage um, landlords to not make a very um, uh, sort of swift transition but provide enough time for implementation of the rule. Um, in terms of trainings, we not only train sort of senior level um, landlord and management company administration, but we also encourage um, management companies to send all of their staff to trainings, including maintenance staff. We've actually found that maintenance staff has been some of the um, biggest advocates for smoke-free housing rules because of their, um, you know, that they're, it's a workplace for them, and this is an issue around um, providing a smoke-free workplace. Um, and so, we, you know, we're really encouraging our partners, and we're taking the lead to reach out to new partners um, in the, the world of homelessness prevention, substance abuse, and mental health, and sort of um, thinking about ways to partner with folks that advocate for people um, that have very high smoking rates, that might have a difficult time with the transition, um, to reduce the likelihood of displacement, but also maximize compliance with the rule. Um, and I will turn it back to Esmerna to wrap up. Okay. So some of our successes here have been working with um, the Department of Housing and Community Development to develop or to uh, release guidance for uh, small free housing policies to all of their uh, local municipal housing authorities. And as a result, by the end of 2015, we estimate that over 70 public housing authorities will be smoke free. Some of the successes also include working with community develop, development corporations in Boston, and also we've been able to provide TA to several major management companies as they've adopted portfolio-wide policies. So, those, uh, so that's a summary of some of our successes here in the state. And you can see here we have a couple of links to connect you with our resources or some of the resources that we have. And thank you for listening, and this is our contact information. Thank you so much, Esmerna and Kathleen, for some very resourceful information and sharing all the great work that's happening in Massachusetts. Just a reminder to our participants that a copy of all these slides will be available to each of you as an archive on both the ASPO and NATO website and will be emailed to all of our participants in the next few days. I want to now introduce our next speaker, John Walker. John has been employed with the Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency of Nashville, Tennessee since 1999, where he served as an assistant manager of over 600 housing units and is now the social service coordinator. He is also a summer grant reviewer and coordinator of the Smoking Cessation Program. He holds a master's degree in public management from Cumberland University and a Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt University. We are happy to have you with us today, John. I'm going to go, to, going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my um, presentation will be from a local perspective. I was given the responsibility from our um, Director of, um, of Housing to introduce into a property to extend to seven other properties a non-smoking policy. We took three approaches, which is the dissemination of policy, uh, developing partners, and um, the behavior modification. Again, we were working within a one uh, property in the beginning, and then we were able to go to six other high-rises. Uh, as you see, the dissemination of policy, we were able to um, meet with our residents uh, uh, to in, within uh, giving them an open letter to let them see, to ask them questions, to get their opinions on uh, just what they thought smoke-free uh, would be. We were able to just to put out a uh, questionnaire, which you have on the screen here, where we asked more specific questions about their experience with with smoking. Um, in that letter, we in that 
the result of that questionnaire, we found out that 40% of our residents had some experience with uh, smoking, and that has to, relates to at least 100 cigarettes a year. We were able to, um, to also give other information in the form of a newsletter that we uh, were able to um, disseminate the information to our residents in terms of how they uh, to, to give them information on how uh, on what smoke free housing would be information that would give them support as well as um, information that they could would receive on just what the damage of what uh, cig what cigarette smoking or tobacco use would uh, would do to them in in terms of their health. Um, in the dissemination of the policy, we continue to uh, work closely with our residents. In, in terms of, of getting ideas from them of how we would uh, be able to introduce the policy. We met, we had several, we had at least two service fairs where we were able to meet with our residents and also introduce uh, partners that we were able to uh, begin to work with. One of our partners was Vanderbilt School of Nursing. What they were able to do was disseminate or uh, to, to get questions on uh, within a questionnaire of uh, just uh, the uh, um, uh, resident's um, opinion or how they would take the, 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 the legality or the, the, the idea that smoking breached their freedom. Um, by using the Vanderbilt, question, Vanderbilt students, we're able to get within the apartments. And the Vanderbilt students, we've had a relationship with them for several years, and they've been uh, able to get in and out of the apartments and really get a chance to not only let them know what the policy would be, but also to um, be able to receive information from our residents. We also partnered with the health department who was able to bring in uh, several resources for us and information that we were able to use. I'd like to go back uh, just to the beginning when I should have stated that um, um, we were able to, uh, we, we introduced this on our own without the use of the health department. And then we were able to bring them in as a partner, and when we did, they were to help us in tremendous ways. We also uh, connected with neighborhood clinics to be able to get the medical support for those people that would would like to use resources to help them stop uh, to be able to stop smoking. The behavioral modification aspect was we were, we approached this through using through looking at the health, the economics, and the, and the, and the um, communication or the use in the community of, of tobacco. The health, we were able to put information out about just what uh, cigarettes would do. And, in the pre and I'm glad to see that there was previous information on just what the, the, the deaths of tobacco were, the uh, carcinogens in tobacco, and to be able to, to meet with them uh, on a weekly basis. What we did where we were able to meet with our residents weekly in an open meeting where we were able to talk and to work with them on, on establishing quit dates and establishing uh, some ideas and also carry on, the, carry on the discussion about what tobacco would, how damaging tobacco is to that. From the um, open maintenance weekly meeting, we were able to have uh, a 12-week session that was that was uh, conducted by the health department. These meetings were closed, which was able to give, this, give them a high amount of control of setting quit dates and, and, and also doing a process of behavior modification to help those residents that needed to, uh, that wanted to, 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 to stop smoking. From that group, we were able to get five that actually did stop, and we had a, a large number of residents that would reduce their smoking um, in, in, a, in a very large way. You'll see a picture here of um, there was a, we, we um, were able to, this is a cop, this is a picture of one of our smoke sheds that we put on the outside of each one of our seven high-rise properties. The, uh, the, the gentleman in the suit there was, that suit was given to us, it was a, a, the health department let us use it to, to be able to let residents know in a service fairs that we were to have for them the idea of uh, w what it meant to uh, stop smoking. The policy that we were able to, to put together for our smoke, to for our stop smoking, was we were able to put 
the um, smoke sheds at least 35 feet away from the properties. And we also were, were able to establish that all smoking would not be done in the common areas. Um, working very close with the residents, I was able to uh, have an, an open office policy where residents came in and out of, of my office to discuss their private uh, issues with uh, cigarette smoking. Some of the private issues were that we were able to find out that a large number of the of the residents that were using cigarette smoke also had some mental health issues, and we found that the cigarettes that cigarette smoking also uh, was also used as a drug to 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 help control their mental health issues. So that added to the difficulty of of being able to enforce. Um, this on a consistent basis, knowing that we have other greater issues with that. We are still uh, looking at those issues and trying, and at least trying to be very fair with how we enforce our policy. Um, the, uh, the overriding uh, um, advantage that we were able to gain from our cigarette uh, policy was that we were able to, um, we were able to we were able to increase our conversation with our residents on the use of tobacco. We were able to get several of our residents to reduce their smoking, um, their use of smoking, their frequency of smoking, smoking, and we were also able to, to give information to our community that cigarette smoking was, um, was, was dangerous. You know, another piece of information that we were able to share was that the people that were residents, the potential residents who were on our waiting list, we also sent them letters to let them know that that cigarette smoking was part of our policy. Some of the, some of the returns from those, from those letters was that there were many uh, people from the community that wanted to come into our apartments that were very happy that we had put this policy in place and look forward to that. The the um, we only got a small return of people that uh, did not want to um, smoke cigarettes, or did not want to come and live with uh, within our property because we banned cigarette smoke. Um, as as of today, the um, we have found that the youth in our uh, shelters that many of our residents are using the shelters. To, um, to to smoke to to smoke in those shelters rather than in their apartments, but we still do have an issue with people that continue to smoke within our um, w within our our property. We also face the issue with um, smoke damage, uh, damage with fire, and also we have been able we have not realized a large increase in our maintenance charge, but there certainly is on the way, and we are looking forward to to, to some increase in that. Basically, the experience with uh, bringing, um, with being able to um, bring in the smoke policy locally within a property was uh, was also was challenging in the most part that we had a large number of people that did uh, want that did want to challenge the issue. So we were able to share with them the Clean Air Act, the fact that that there is secondhand smoke, and there's also the uh, idea of what third-hand smoke was from uh, the residue was left over from from uh, a long term that was affecting everyone's health. The presently there is an ongoing conversation with residents about how tobacco smoke is affecting their health. Now, for me working as a social service coordinator, this is I'm able to uh, have this ongoing conversation. To be able to approach uh, various residents on the tobacco use, and also um, able to see um, some reduction in their uh, use of tobacco, um, I would say that probably the overall overriding issue is that there are several residents that don't smoke. Uh, there are sixty percent of our residents that don't smoke that have given us uh, a. a a lot, give, has spoken very positive in terms of the, of the approach that we've taken. This continues to be an ongoing issue because there are several several um, uh, residents that are coming in that are new that that we are able to that we're not we have not we cut down on the number of uh, of uh, 
classes and behavior modification classes that that we have we have done and been able to um, and not been able to disseminate that, but we are continuing to give it the effort. And uh, we do see an overall reduction within uh, tobacco use. The local has certainly been a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing the great work that you're doing in Nashville. Now, I would like to take a moment to return to Peter Ashley with HUD uh, to provide some follow-up and additional points before we close up with resources and Q&A. John, or sorry, Peter, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on a, a couple of things. Um, when I was listening, I, I know that uh, there was a, a point made about uh, the misconception that uh, smoke-free policies uh, would increase uh, vacancy rates, uh, misconception by um, property owners. Uh, I believe someone brought that up. Um, if not, I wanted to address it because it's another common misconception. Uh, there's no evidence of that. Uh, I think um, really um, as advocates uh, um, you need to educate property owners that uh, it's the opposite, that there's a strong demand for smoke-free housing. Um, so I wanted to, to mention that. Also, um, I think it was the Massachusetts presentation, they, they mentioned working with, uh, with residents. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, often, uh, especially public housing um, developments, we'll have, uh, we'll have a resident uh, tenant organization and uh, you could, as a health department, uh, look to presenting uh, to that group on the benefits of uh, small free housing. I, I love to see this. Uh, from the ground up, the demand come from the ground up. Uh, I, I know we, we tend to focus on management, but uh, uh, ground up is, uh, is also a, a way to do it. Um, another th point that was made, uh, I think, by John was the, uh, the ability or the opportunity to partner with uh, local uh, colleges. He mentioned uh, Vanderbilt. We've seen that um, in a number of cases where uh, if there's a local uh, university, especially if there's a school of public health, uh, that they're interested in helping um, helping uh, housing providers uh, go smoke free. Uh, so it's another uh, resource that can be used, whether in terms of delivering uh, maybe a questionnaire to residents, holding uh, focus groups, uh, that type of thing. There's a, there's a number of opportunities there. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about enforcement since that's really, I, it tends to be the, the biggest concern of housing providers. Um, so I just put this slide together with a, with a few points um, that came out of, uh, most of these are, I think are in our action guide. Um, not surprising that, uh, you know, the, the provider must explain the uh, enforcement policy very clearly uh, before the implementation um, starts, uh, talk about the, provide the steps that will be followed in implementing um, smoke-free policies. Uh, generally, there's a multi-step process for uh, repeat offenders. I'll, uh, next couple of slides, uh, get into that. Uh, provide a way for residents to report violations uh, without being confrontational. So uh, a number, a phone number to call, um, a form uh, that they can fill out uh, and submit to the uh, management office anonymously. Uh, I think um, also the uh, use of maintenance workers when they go into units, um, they can uh, they can smell smoke, they can see evidence of smoke. Um, uh, they often go in for other other purposes, but uh, that's an opportunity for them to uh, look for evidence of uh, of smoking. Um, and then um, responding um, quickly and consistently to any violations uh, is very important. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the stepwise enforcement process. Uh, these next couple of slides, I just have uh, examples. Um, they vary, uh, you know, the, the steps vary from uh, one housing provider to another. Uh, this is uh, Duluth, uh, Minnesota Housing Authority. Uh, first violation, verbal discussion and a breach of policy letter. Uh, second violation, um, discussion of the policy and they actually have uh, the resident sign 
uh, a paper indicating that they understand the policy and that they could be terminated uh, if they have another a third violation. And then the third violation in this case is a, uh, an eviction letter. Um, oftentimes you'll see uh, providers um, refer residents to cessation services. Um, you know, they don't have to quit smoking, uh, but it, uh, if, even if they reduce significantly uh, their smoking, it can help them uh, comply uh, with the policy. Um, this next, next example comes from um, Home Forward, which is uh, uh, the public housing agency in Portland, Oregon. And you can see it's a, it's a quite different approach, uh, five-step process. It's really, I guess you could say, more of a public health-focused approach. Uh, they provide uh, cessation materials um, along each, uh, with each step, uh, and uh, they don't get to a written warning until the third violation. So uh, a bit more lenient uh, than what you'll see with other uh, housing providers. Um, I suspect they have uh, more resources uh, than, than some providers would. Um, of course, public housing has a, a bit of a more, I guess you could say, um, social service mission. Uh, so you'll see, you, you don't want to evict anybody from public housing uh, because there are few opportunities. Uh, you know, if someone with that, with very low income, uh, if they're evicted, there aren't many more housing uh, opportunities. So um, this case, you can see kind of a bend over backward policy um, to provide the, uh, the resident with uh, services uh, that, will, that will help them stay in the housing. So a couple of different approaches. I just wanted to, uh, to walk you through that. Thanks. Thank you again, Peter, for coming back on a second time during this webinar and, and continuing to share with us so much useful information. We would now like to share some resources available from both NACHO and AFSO that support state and local health departments promoting smoke-free multi-unit housing. Erica will begin with sharing some NACHO resources. Thank you. NACHO has a number of resources that can be used by local health departments and other organizations to support their tobacco prevention and control efforts. Our webpage is a good place to begin looking at our resources. NACHO maintains a searchable online toolkit containing tobacco resources from across the country, including guides, fact sheets, and model policies. And you can contact NACHO through the tobacco email address listed or through my direct email address that is provided at the end of this presentation. And this is Diana. AFSO also has several resources on our website that may be helpful for states. Um, on the slide, you can see some of the uh, highlighted documents that ASSO has recently released on tobacco. The first is a comprehensive tobacco control guide for state and territorial health officials, and the second is a booklet highlighting recommendations about smoking cessation strategies for women before, during, and after pregnancy. Both of these publications include examples of the work of several states uh, in the areas of tobacco control and prevention. Uh, on our website, you can also find our written comment letters on proposed tobacco control regulations, including issues like menthol and e-cigarettes, and the web address for tobacco, for ASSO's tobacco website, where you can access more information about all these resources, is up on your screen now and will also be on the last slide of the presentation, along with my contact information. Thanks, Diana. At this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. Please, if you have additional questions, type them in the chat box. We already have over a dozen questions that are in the queue, so I'm going to ask all of the speakers to perk up their ears because I might be calling on one or more of you to answer a particular question. We're going to get through as many as we possibly can. Um, one question that is fairly general that I would like to open to everyone, uh, um, particularly Peter and Scott, um, is what are you doing in regard to e-cigarettes in your policies? Uh, this is Scott. E-cigarettes is something that we have so far remained silent on. 
uh, e-cigarettes are currently allowed uh, in the units, but there's, you know, we're working with uh, some smoke-free housing advocates in North Carolina to determine the safety factor of them and uh, so that we can explain to residents of why we're not having them. So we don't have anything concerning e-cigarettes concerning uh, uh, right now. Thank you. Uh, Peter, what uh, is the position from HUD so far on e-cigarettes? HUD hasn't come out with a position on e-cigarettes. We're waiting uh, for uh, more research to, to be done on them. We know there are some, um, you know, contaminants that have been identified, including, uh, I think, uh, some carcinogens uh, in the emissions. Um, um, but uh, we've, we've kept silent on that and really left it up to the, uh, the provider. Um, yeah, I, I, we certainly have been told that it's, it's easier uh, to include that in uh, smoke-free policies. Uh, you know, one reason is that uh, sometimes when you see the vapor, you, it's difficult to, to tell whether it's uh, tobacco smoke or, or vapor, so it's, it's easier to have a blanket policy. But, uh, uh, but yeah, we haven't come out with, with a position yet. Thank you. For our presenters in Massachusetts and Nashville, do any of your policies uh, include e-cigarettes? Yeah, this um, is John from Nashville. What what we have done is um, is we have allowed them to use the e-cigarettes inside their apartments, but not in the common areas. And our reason for that was because it 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 the visual use of the e-cigarette in the common areas looks like it, could, it looks like we're allowing cigarettes. So we at, at, at this point, we're allowing e-cigarettes inside the apartment only. Thank you, Massachusetts. Sure, this is Kathleen. Um, so there, there's been a little bit, I think, of an evolutionary process on this, um, mostly because we started this work before e-cigarettes were prevalent. Um, so many of the the large housing authorities here, including the Boston Housing Authority, put a policy into place before they were really considering e-cigarettes. Um, we have since then sort of told landlords what we know about e-cigarettes and what we don't know and sort of left it at their discretion. We have heard, similar to what Peter said, some landlords say that, you know, it's easier to have an all-inclusive policy, but we have also heard on the flip side that, um, from some landlords who have excluded them from the policy or just sort of not commented either way that um, they have they think that by not um, prohibiting e-cigarettes that people are actually more compliant with not smoking combustibles so um, I think that you know it's still to be determined so there's a lot of unanswered questions about them Great, thank you everyone. Um, a question I would say to Scott first. Um, there have been a few questions about how health departments might approach private property owners. Uh, do you have any suggestions on good ways to initiate that conversation with a private property owner about changing policies? Yeah, I think I would probably start with the, the local <coughs> or the immediate property manager to find out uh, who they need to talk to, or if that property manager is one that can point you in the right direction or give you the correct information that you need. Because um, when, when I was contacted by you know, housing authorities and smoke-free advocates, it had started with uh, a contact at, at a site level, and then you know, the site manager called me and said, "Hey, this is you know this this entity or this group called me, uh, and they were asking these questions and." It, and it happened to come at the same time as we were doing smoke-free housing. Because uh, when, when we got into the smoke-free housing and started to implement this, I didn't realize that there was this amount of information and assistance and help that was out there. Uh, so I kind of went about it on my own, and it, it just happened to get a phone call at the right time. So I, I think I'm, I am not the, uh, I'm the exception to, you know, we were already doing it, and they we happened to find each other instead of someone coming to me and presenting the idea. But the idea of smoke-free housing has, has gained so much traction over the last few years that people are willing to talk about it, especially if they can explain the benefits of it, and especially to, to a property owner, uh, of how it can benefit 
their property by implementing such a policy. Thank you. Uh, for Ismerna and Kathleen, how do you suggest, based on your experience, that health departments approach maybe housing authorities or private owners? Do you want me to take that, Ismerna, or do you want to go, go for it? Yeah, um, one of the ways that we can definitely um, at least what we do here in the state is looking at or working with our local um, local programs. They know they know the community specifically. Um, they have formed partnerships. So being able to train these local programs um, and then having them approach uh, uh, the housing their housing providers locally would be at least in the way that we've approached things the most effective ways. So I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Kathleen, but that's one approach or one way to do that. Yeah, so just to clarify, as Myrna was referring to our local programs, those are um, um, local tobacco cessation and prevention programs that are funded through our local health department, or funded by our state health department in the, at the municipal and um, sort of regional level. So that's been one strategy. We've also worked directly with the housing community um, presenting at, at kind of regional meetings, regional conferences of public housing authorities. A lot of the directors get together and meet um, to kind of strategize and, um, you know, just have regular meetings with that on the agenda there. We've worked through our real estate bar association. We've hosted landlord workshops um, across Massachusetts. And so we sort of approached it both from a health perspective and then sort of um, building relationships directly in the housing community with um, associations and other types of um, like entree into that world. Great, thank you. Uh, a question for Scott. Uh, Scott, I know that you're the president of the company, so that puts you in a unique position in terms of deciding to implement a policy. When you were in the process of researching and developing your policy, were there boards or other executives where you found some kind of resistance or conflict, and how did you handle that? And then also, did you have any interference from elected officials or community leaders? Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it, I did not receive a whole lot of pushback be, because when when I took to, like, our, our board, I do have a board of directors that I have to discuss items with, and our owner sits on that board. And our owner owns, you know, the vast majority of our properties, you know, then the other 20% or so we fee manage. But, no, no. and when we made the presentation to them, it was not a hard sell on the heels of million dollars of loss. But during that process, we did sort of play devil's advocate with each other about what we're going to do or what are we, what are we getting ourselves into and what, what's going to happen. Um, and really the, the loss of residents was one of the biggest fears that – that we had, and it was ultimately decided that you know we're going to take a chance at it and see. Uh, you know, we managed a little over 4,200 units, <clears throat> and our our occupancy rates as a portfolio stay at 97, 98 percent. So we haven't seen a mass exodus of of residents anywhere. Uh, actually, one of the one of our competitors, if you will. <clears throat> they have a, a lot of units, and they knew I was going smoke free. And he told me that they would never do that, and he was going to wait at his property with open arms and take all of my residents, and he would fill his property up. But that never happened. And now he and I, uh, I'm helping him and his company implement the smoke free policy, and, and they manage you know somewhere around you know the eight to ten thousand units. So, um, you know, you know, being fearful for owners to to implement a policy like this. I mean, it's simply not there. I know that's a hard sell, and, and but I have not spoke to anyone that has had an issue with implementing a smoke-free policy and the retention of, of uh, residents. People want the smoke-free housing. They just didn't. Uh, it's, it's one of those things, once they have it, they thought, well, it would have been nice to have had this a long time ago. Okay, thank you. And while I have you um, on the mic, Scott, um, yeah. have you had any evictions at any of your properties related to violations? We have. Uh, and only we've only when I say only we've terminated a lot, but we've only had we've only gone to court on three occasions and we've won all three of those. Uh, most people okay. once they once they realize that you're serious about it, they go ahead and move. So. Gotcha. Okay. So if somebody's insistent on on smoking indoor, they find another place to do that. Th that's correct. Okay. Um, John, I'd like to ask you the same question. To your knowledge, have you had any evictions uh, in your housing properties? 
Um, yes, we have had um, a few. It's um, the managers have not grabbed the idea to use this, but what the, the approach that we've taken is that we're doing it like any other illegal substance, and um, and using our warnings and and using um, our, trying to talk to our residents about trying to get them to change. However, we have had um, a few evictions, and we're trying to use. We're more likely using the three, uh, the three approach of a verbal warning, a written warning, and then a final warning where we will uh, take action. Um, we also realize there's some other problems with it that relates to uh, enforcing it. Enforcing this policy is that we have several residents with mental health issues. That 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 actually use use cigarettes along with their other medicines, or they stop using their other medicines to um, um, to medicate themselves or to manage their mental health issues. So there are some other other approaches that we've had to discuss in terms of how we would enforce it. But as to date, we have evicted uh, yes a few people from uh, because of their their uh, tobacco use in their apartment. Thank you. A uh, question for Esmerna or Kathleen. Um, many uh, nonprofits that advocate for the homeless often challenge smoke-free housing policies as a top-down initiative that discriminates against the homeless. What are your recommendations on working with that type of perception or argument when you're interacting with nonprofits and housing? Do you want to go for it, Kathleen? Yeah, sure. That's a great question, um, one that I get a lot. And in addition to sort of um, advocates for vulnerable populations like the homeless specifically, I'm often asked about that, just about um, low-income populations in general and is this work targeting low-income populations. Um, my answer, um, I like to sort of flip that on its head. I really see this as a social justice issue. Um, people with means can um, move if they're being exposed to smoke and they're sick. Um, they can afford to move to a new place. And I, I don't know about in the rest of the country, but if you drive in downtown Boston, you can see um, you know, landlords marketing smoke-free properties as amenity, and people will pay a lot of money to live in a smoke-free building. That option isn't available across the market spectrum, which is why we um, focus a lot of our work on sort of bringing the affordable housing community along with the rest of the market. So that's sort of an aside. But to address the issue around the homeless um, advocates in general, um, a lot uh, our approach has been to A, show demand for smoke-free housing, even in populations where there's really high smoking rates, there, are, there tends to be a very high demand for smoke-free housing, and that's what our surveys have shown, so we use that data. Um, the, a lot of, or actually in Massachusetts anyway, and I'm not sure if this is the case across the country, but shelters are, are smoke-free, and a lot of places that people are transitioning from, unless they're actually living on the street, they're most likely living um, in a place that is smoke-free already. Um, and so it's not actually all that big of a change for some folks that are living um, in um, other types of sort of state-supported housing that's not public housing already. Um, but really, we, we use the information that we have, which shows that secondhand smoke makes people really sick. Um, people at the lower end of the income spectrum tend to have higher rates of disease um, and that these policies are really working to protect the health of everybody in the building um, and that, again, the, the places are not smoker-free, they're smoke-free, and so, um, you know, people would not lose housing if they just complied with the policy. I hope that's helpful. Uh, that, thank you. Um, I have a question that I'm going to pitch to each of the three communities, and I will go to each of you for a response. Um, the question is, has anybody addressed the idea of marijuana smoking indoors and included that with their no smoking policies? Um, I'll ask John if that has been addressed in Nashville. Uh, no, that hasn't been addressed. Uh, we see it as an illegal substance. Thank you. Um, Scott, how does that work for Landura? No, no, we don't. We don't allow it because it's it's still considered smoking and smoke free, 
and even in states, uh, in Washington State, where it, it is allowed, it's where we still receive federal subsidies. Um, it's still not a federal, you know, uh, it's still federal law, and it's still illegal uh, at the federal level. So the, the people that we receive funds from are still not going to allow uh, the use of marijuana in the in the units. And that's interesting as we have more states um, allowing that. So it's interesting to see how that's playing out for you. Um, for as Myrna or Kathleen, uh, do you have any remarks regarding any of the Massachusetts communities? Yeah, so we have uh, medicinal marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, and we're sort of waiting for um, dispensaries to open up. But um, like others said, you know, um, landlords are are within their legal rights to include marijuana smoking in the smoke-free policy. Um, and even if somebody were to have a card to allow them to, to um, take marijuana for medicinal purposes, they don't have to smoke it. And so we've all, we landlords include um, marijuana in a, you know, a smoking form in their policies, and um, people may be allowed to use it um, in a sort of a food way of intake or something um, other than smoking. Great, thank you. Um, I have a tough question for Peter that has come through the chat box in many incarnations. Um, what is the barrier to HUD creating a mandate for smoke-free housing? <laughs> well, that's a good, good question. Um, I, you know, I think there's been hesitation. Um, you know, our, my office, we're more um, uh, public health oriented uh, office within HUD. So, uh, you know, we've, we've been, uh, I guess, uh, more, more promoting aggressive measures, but um, our program offices, uh, their first focus, of course, is providing housing. And they, housing providers have a lot of challenges. And I think there's a hesitancy to give them another mandate. Um, it would be, I guess you could consider it an unfunded mandate, even though there's not um, a lot of cost involved. So, uh, and we've also seen um, that this is being adopted uh, at, a, at a quickening pace uh, voluntarily. 15% um, maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but not long ago we were in single digits. Uh, so uh, I think those are some of the reasons. At, that doesn't mean that uh, this won't change. We've got uh, a new uh, secretary here now, Secretary Castro. He's, uh, you know, reviewing all policies. I know um, other agencies um, um, have uh, weighed in on this and um, uh, are promoting this, uh, you know, in terms of mandatory. So, you know, all I can say is wait and see. It, it, it could change. Hi, Thank this is Sarah from the Office of Public Housing in HUD. Um, one issue that's come up that we're really interested in finding out more on is we know if we were looking at public housing and, and their smoke-free policies, where we have some very rural agencies with maybe just one building, whether there would be assistance from local health departments. Um, we weren't quite able to pin that down, but it would be great to hear if there's any folks in the line that could weigh in there. Because uh, we wanted to say if you are going smoke-free that you should work with your local health department or advocates. but we're recognizing that in many rural areas, they may not know where to go. Yeah, thank you, Tara, for that additional clarification. Um, I have a comparable question for Esmerna. Um, I'm sure that the state of Massachusetts had considered the option of whether a statewide mandate was uh, possible. Do you have any information on whether that is legal or whether it was attempted or whether it's strategic choice to do something different? It's more, um, so at this point, we are not considering a state um, a state policy for many reasons. Um, here in the state, we have a number of local communities. We have 351 um, cities and towns, and the enforcement situation of implementing something at a statewide level, um, we see it has something that would be a bit complicated right now. But um, it's not. It's not to say that um, in in, a, in the future, or in the future, we might consider something like this. We are um, looking at it as building a foundation right now, and and building momentum, and having um, or creating demand at this point, and seeing how we can approach the, maybe something at a statewide um, in the future. Thank you. 
Bye. And that concludes our Q&A portion for today's webinar. We want to take the time to thank each of you for joining us today. As we mentioned earlier, you will be immediately directed to an evaluation um, concluding today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey as it really does provide us with useful information for our future products. ASCO and NHO would like to thank the CDC Office on Smoking and Health for sponsoring this webinar. We also want to thank our speakers, Peter Ashley, Tara Radosevich, Scott Alderman, Esmerna DeMazzo, Kathy McCabe, and John Walker. A recording of today's webinar and the slides will be available on our website within the next few days at the web addresses shown on your screen now. We hope that you will use this webinar as a resource and we'll share the link with others once it is available. If you have any follow-up questions about today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact the team at NATO and ASPA respectively. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.